It was early morning, September 11, 2001. Across the world, the U.S. was still sleeping, but it was unknowingly about to face one of the greatest tragedies of our time. Meanwhile, the sun already shone timidly above Myanmar in Southeast Asia. A group of scientists were having a quick respite before venturing back into the mountainous jungles. Their mission was to find and analyze as many new species as possible – snakes, plants, insects, and birds. It didn't matter. Myanmar has a glorious ecosystem, but September 11th proved to be a fateful day all over the world. As Joseph Slowinski, the leader of the expedition, reached into a specimen bag to get a hold of a seemingly harmless snake, a different, more intimate type of tragedy prepared to strike. In this video, we'll take a look at Joseph's deadly encounter with what he loved best and his friend's desperate fight to keep the man alive. Joseph Slowinski took his first trip to Myanmar in 1997. Ten more such expeditions followed, not only because the country was, and still is, breathtaking, but because it helped Slowinski achieve his dream and fulfill his life's work. Joseph was a renowned herpetologist, a scientist studying amphibians and reptiles. In 2001, at 38 years old, the man was already extraordinarily accomplished, having published over 40 peer-reviewed articles and one book. He was, first and foremost, a nature enthusiast with a preference for snakes. In fact, he specialized in the analysis of Elapidae, also known as the most venomous snakes out there. Coral snakes, cobras, crates, and mambas all are part of this specific snake family, and Joseph Slowinski loved them all despite or maybe because of their tiny, deadly fangs. The 38-year-old scientist had always been enamored with cold-blooded, scaly animals. While many, many people find themselves disgusted and terrified by the creatures, Joseph thought of snakes as beautiful and fascinating. Still, he was plenty aware of how dangerous they were. While he was never careless in handling the slithering beasts, the herpetologist knew very well even the smallest bite could prove fatal. He loved snakes all the same. His obsession with the animals started when he was quite young. Other kids might have preferred kittens, but little Joseph Slowinski was more interested in reptiles. He began catching frogs and small snakes when he was five and he was bitten by a rattlesnake in Nebraska when he was 15. Ever since then, he took a special interest in venomous snakes. That's why he began his long academic career as a herpetologist. Slowinski was even a professor of biology for a while, but he was first and foremost a man of action. With his bubbly, ever-excited personality, the man didn't just want to spend his life in a lab analyzing and writing academic papers. Instead, he had a knack for conducting scientific field research, where he could experience any ecosystem and observe his beloved creatures in their natural habitats. By the time he was 38, Joseph, who was a herpetologist with the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, had combed through the United States, Mexico, Peru, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Jamaica, and the Bahamas in search for new and exciting snake species. But it was Myanmar, a Southeast Asian country formerly known as Burma, where Slowinski found a true herpetological paradise. To this day, Myanmar houses some of the largest intact natural ecosystems in Southeast Asia. The country's a biodiversity hotspot. Beginning with his first expedition there in 1997, the man had discovered 18 new species of reptiles in the jungles. Nothing could stand between his devotion to his field of research, his long tongs which he used to pick up snakes, and the thrill he got from contributing to science. Time and time again, he returned to the country. However, there had been many obstacles in organizing this latest expedition, which started in early September 2001. For starters, Joseph had been planning this trip for a long time, but he suspected another scientist working in Burma had blocked the original funding, leaving him to cobble together funds from various sources in order to finally start his research. That's why when Joseph finally put together a multidisciplinary team of some 10 academics, he had a fair warning for them. This is probably going to be one of the hardest things you have ever done, he told his team. And as it turned out, he had been right. Because of the delay caused by the lack of funds, the expedition started later than previously planned. 
It was the rainy season in Myanmar, when the monsoon rages through the country and powerful rains fall mercilessly on the jungle. That wasn't the only problem, either. Slowinski had to conduct his research while also managing the team of academics and over 90 porters carrying their supplies. The supplies were unbelievably scarce, despite the generous amount of money Joseph had paid to ensure no one would go hungry. There was a Burmese guide handling most of the problems, but he couldn't and wouldn't act without Joseph's blessing. And finally, there was another inconvenience, one hard to overlook. Myanmar's government promised to send two military doctors and a radio phone to accompany the team and make sure everyone would be safe while exploring the stubborn jungles. But there was no sign of any of that. Still, the expedition took off. The team was formed of Slowinski's former students, as well as other herpetologists, ornithologists, entomologists, and some Burmese students. The latter were part of Slowinski's effort to train local biologists in DNA systematics and museum curation techniques to improve conservation efforts in Myanmar. The trip began and the scientists advanced farther and farther away from civilization and further inside the jungle. It turned out Joseph's warning had been right. The weather was miserable. It was raining constantly, rivulets running through the sticky mud, which made each step a chore, especially since the plan was to climb above 10,000 feet while also analyzing a vast variety of habitats. Each day, fascinating animals, be them snakes or frogs or anything else, were captured and meticulously analyzed. The expedition's photographer, who was also one of Slowinski's best friends, took stunning pictures of the creatures. Every night, there'd be talk of the day's catch and of dreams, worries, and desires. But according to Mark Moffat, a tropical biologist who was part of the expedition, it seemed like the hardships of managing the research were slowly catching up to Joseph Slowinski. A day before what would be the expedition's leader's final encounter with the snake, Slowinski seemed to miss some of his on-brand excitement and vivacity. He walked sluggishly, his fingers shaking with any small motion. Then September 11th came, and the entire world trembled. The scientific research team did too, but for entirely different reasons. That morning found them at the bottom of a foggy jungle valley in a tiny remote village called Ratball. It was about 7 a.m. when one of the Burmese field assistants brought Slowinski a snake enclosed in a specimen bag. Although various accounts of what was said that morning have since emerged, the general consensus is that the field assistants told Joseph he had been bitten by a specimen of that particular species the day before. The man reportedly didn't know the exact species of the snake, but believed it to be non-venomous. For reasons unknown, and despite all of his long years of experience and well-formed safety habits, Slowinski reached into the bag with his bare hand, not giving it a second thought. Then he felt a tiny bite and looked down to see a foot-long pencil-thin snake, resembling a near-perfect mimic of the multi-banded crate. It was easy to understand the Burmese field assistant's mistake, but the snake that bit Slowinski was no mimic. Instead, it was a crate, a particularly venomous snake. Realization dawned on the herpetologist instantly. Still, he didn't lose hope. After all, this wasn't his first encounter with a venomous snake. He had been bitten by a cobra before, but in that case, he'd suffered a dry bite, a bite without venom. And of course, there was the incident involving a spitting cobra only a year before. The snake shot venom into Joseph's eyes. Had it not been for the Burmese locals and their traditional cures, he would have gone blind in a matter of hours. So, Joseph remained in high spirits, at least on the outside. He had checked for bite marks when the snake bit him, but he couldn't find any. He sat down for breakfast with his team, cracking jokes. Then he went for a nap, and when he woke at about 8 a.m., he noticed a tingling in the arm. Being an expert in his field, the man knew the strange sensation was definitely bad news. Crate venom contains powerful neurotoxins, their first horrible effect being loss of motor skill. Fifteen minutes after he discovered the tingling, two assistants were sent to the nearest town with a radio in order to call for help. Myanmar forbade satellite cell phones, and the team hadn't received the radio phone government officials had promised. Then Joseph Slowinski gathered his team around him and explained what was going to happen to him in great detail. According to multiple accounts given by the various team members, every one of his predictions came true. 
first, Joseph's breathing grew raspy. He had to reach up to open his eyelids. Eventually, his head began to droop. His speech became slurred, and then he couldn't speak at all. Instead, he wrote messages asking the team to support his head and advising them to adjust his position. If I vomit, he wrote, it could be bad. Then his diaphragm stopped working. Before he lost his speech, he told them that if he was to survive, they'd have to breathe for him. After 48 hours, he told them, the neurotoxins might leave his body. At 3 p.m., the assistants returned with bad news. The Myanmar military wanted more information before sending a helicopter to rescue Slowinski. Two other assistants were sent back, but it was no use. The heavy rains made it impossible for the pilots to bring down the helicopter. They gave up. Soldiers and a doctor arrived on foot, but the respirator they brought along was old and no one could get it to work. Instead, in an amazing display of humanity, the team took turns throughout the night to breathe for their mentor. They did so for 26 hours. The following day, on September 12th at around 1225, Joseph Slowenski's pulse was gone. The team began three hours of CPR to no avail. When the helicopter finally managed to land, it was obviously far too late to save the renowned herpetologist. His body was cremated, as requested by his family, and his ashes were flown back to San Francisco. To those who were around him during his final hours, finding out about 9-11 was both strange and painful. Two different tragedies had struck at the same time, leaving their world emptier. Joseph Slowinski's death was heartbreaking to the entire scientific community. He's still remembered for his discoveries and devotion. But those who knew him always bring up his devotion and his enthusiasm. He died doing what he loved, and perhaps he wasn't scared, but his passing still remains a great loss. Three new reptile species have been named after the herpetologist since his departure. Pastor Mac Randall Wolford hailed from McDowell County in West Virginia and belonged to the Full Gospel Apostolic House of the Lord Jesus in Matoica. It was one of the few remaining Appalachian Pentecostal sects called Sign Followers. The community had been living in the Appalachian Hills of the southeastern U.S. for the last 90 years. They have literally lived and died by their beliefs. The sect or Sign Followers draw their belief from a passage in the Gospel according to Mark, which says, and these signs it shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Besides handling venomous serpents, the sect also engages in consuming salvation cocktails, which are a potent mix of strychnine poison. They feel it does not harm them as their beliefs make them immune. Serpent handling has been banned in all but two southern states. However, it's still practiced by the Appalachian community, with handlers and the faithful refusing treatment when bitten, saying it's all part of God's plan. Moreover, they prefer to call it serpent handling to emphasize that reptiles are venomous monsters, not common snakes. Amazingly, there have been less than 100 confirmed deaths in the history of the sect, but Pastor Wolford's turned out to be the most shocking. It was the day after the pastor's 44th birthday, and he chose to celebrate the way he loved best, preaching to his congregation, snake in hand. Pastor Wolford had handled snakes before. It wasn't his first time. After all, he was born into a snake-handling family. His father, too, had been a pastor and died from snake bite. But that didn't stop the family, nor Pastor Mac, from doing what they did. If God wanted you to go, you would. The flamboyant preacher was no stranger to snake bites and had been bitten before. He always insisted God was testing his faith, and it didn't require medication unless necessary. Pastor Wilford had been on a tour like always. He loved going from town to town, preaching with snakes. He was famous and his proficiency in dealing with venomous varieties fascinated the experts. The terrifying incident took place on Sunday, May 27, 2012. The pastor organized a homecoming service at the Panther State Forest, about 70 miles from Matoica. For that day, he chose to bring his favorite rattler, Sheba. 
The gathering would be a typical one, where Pastor Wolford would deliver his sermon with Sheba coiled around his hand, just like he had done several times before. A yellow timber rattler can provoke fear in others, but not Pastor Wolford. He was unafraid because he believed he was protected. He had even draped snakes around his neck and danced with them, sometimes shirtless. Visitors to his home in Bluefield recalled how he would keep a spare bedroom full of venomous snakes. Pastor Wolford had organized an open-air ceremony in Panther Wildlife Management Area, a state park just 80 miles west of Bluefield. It began with the pastor delivering a fantastic sermon. He had a knack for firing up his audience into a frenzy. Thirty minutes after the sermon, Pastor Wolford took the yellow timber rattlesnake, which he had placed in the hands of a church member, and began handling it himself. The beautiful serpent looked fantastic and was stunning, with its brown and yellow scales shining in the sunlight. As he passed the snake from his left hand to the right, the snake crawled onto his shoulder, but then it began slithering down his body. Before he knew what was happening, the snake bit Pastor Wolford on his thigh. It was just a regular bite, and the congregation remained remarkably unfazed and in their seats. Okay, okay, the pastor was bit. He got bit before, and so did many of them. No big deal. They were protected. Like all vipers, the poison of any timber rattler is potent enough to kill a human. What's surprising is that yellow timber rattlers aren't aggressive snakes. Rather than bite, they shy away because they are docile creatures, even though they can be deadly. The snake does not attack when threatened, but retreats into hiding. Yet this specimen bit the pastor. Well, maybe it was indeed all part of God's plan. Pastor Wolford knew he was bitten. He must have felt a searing pain in his thigh, but he calmly grasped the snake, put it back in its box, and sat down. He must have summoned up all his energy to stay conscious, because when the venom of a timber rattler takes hold, it acts quickly. With no treatment, a victim loses consciousness. Another 15 minutes passed, and soon the gathering figured out all was not well with the pastor. He began sweating profusely and appeared to be losing consciousness. The congregation's members had to carry him to a nearby chair. When he failed to recover, the pastor was then taken to his mother-in-law's house nearby. Even though in pain, Pastor Wilford wasn't too worried because, like before, he thought he would survive. He was a staunch believer and had faith. The venom, however, didn't, and soon it circulated throughout his body. Dying from the venom of a timber snake is painful. Unlike a black mamba, a crate, or a king cobra, it takes longer, and a victim most probably dies within two or three days. The poison of all timber snakes is a lethal cocktail of hemotoxins and neurotoxins. This is why the deadly reptile is considered one of North America's biggest and most dangerous snakes. Three hours after he was bitten, the first thing to fail was the pastor's kidneys, yet he kept thinking he would survive. Judging by the pastor's condition, an expert would have quickly figured out his organs were slowly shutting down. Ten hours had lapsed, yet he was without any venom, the only life-saving treatment. Then common sense prevailed on some people around the pastor. They decided he needed treatment. Sadly, it was too late. After being admitted to the Bluefield Regional Medical Center, he was declared dead. The entire episode of Pastor Wolford's death was documented by a young journalist, Lauren Pond, who recalled how Pastor Wolford was a lovely man who tried to make her understand his faith. Pond had stayed with the pastor for a year, and describing the moment he was bitten, she said, Suddenly, an eerie stillness fell over the picnic site. Han grew fond of the pastor and said his death deeply disturbed her, and she had never really come to terms with it. Han further described the congregation as devastated because no one expected him to die such an agonizing death. The aftermath of the pastor's death brought about a severe reaction from the park authorities, who said they were unaware of the nature of the event. Had they known about it, permission would not have been given. What do you think? Was Pastor Wolford's death justified in the name of religion? Should common sense have prevailed by rushing him to an emergency room? 
Elliot Sensman from Pennsylvania loved snakes and did everything he could to rescue and rehabilitate them. It was ironic that he died from one of the most awful circumstances. Elliot knew how to handle snakes and not just the little ones. He would rescue pythons and boa constrictors too. On that ill-fated day of July 20th, 2022, Elliot had begun his day as usual, feeding his snakes. He had no idea what was about to happen. He was extra careful of one snake in particular, a boa constrictor almost 18 feet in length. It was always more aggressive than the others. Unfortunately, one slip around an angry reptile is enough to make it your last moment on Earth. Boa constrictors and pythons are large snakes, and technically they are both constrictors. However, there is a vast difference between the two, even though in most cases, most large snakes are constrictors. An attack by either one can be fatal, given that a python can exert a force of 14 psi, which is 14 pounds of pressure per square inch, enough to kill a human. But a boa constrictor can exert pressures up to 25 pounds per square inch. Now, Elliot had devoted his life to finding injured and abused snakes. His interest in snakes began when he was 10 years old, and since then, he had begun handling them. For the last six years, Elliot had taken up rescuing snakes. A creature that appeared slimy and creepy to others was something beautiful to him. He was passionate about snakes and was obsessed with finding rehabilitated snakes a new home. Boa constrictors are smaller than pythons, known to be the world's longest snakes. They can also be deadlier than boas. And if you're looking at attacks, there has been only one fatal boa attack in the last few decades in the U.S. Pythons, on the other hand, have been known to cause more fatalities in the U.S. and are considered a nuisance. Burmese pythons are regarded as invasive in the Everglades of Florida. The problem is so huge that the U.S. government even organized a python challenge in 2022, leading to hundreds of huge reptiles being captured or killed, some of which turned out to be longer than 15 feet. Whether big or large, it didn't matter to Elliot. He had handled 15-footers several times. On the day of the unfortunate attack, Elliot went about his usual routine. Along with the boa constrictor that killed him, Sensman had two other snakes he had taken in as rescues. The boa constrictor which strangled him was abused and malnourished. It did not settle in well with Elliot, and it always appeared aggressive. Elliot was always very careful with the 18-foot boa constrictor, but a family member later recalled how it wasn't behaving normally the day it attacked Elliot. Elliot's mother, Heather, later told investigators, he was experienced and would never handle that snake alone. He was only checking the enclosure, and all appropriate measures were taken. That's right, Elliot was only about to check its enclosure when the deadly reptile attacked. At that very moment, Elliot might not have suspected anything. Yes, the snake acted weird, but Elliot attributed it to the fact that it was yet to get over its own ordeal and needed time. It had come from a home where it was grossly abused and mistreated. What he didn't bargain for is how the creature could not trust humans again and was waiting to strike. The routine of cleaning and feeding his snakes might have led Elliot to dismiss the boa constrictor's odd behavior. After all, rescue snakes don't exactly behave normally. If they attacked, his family members were trained to respond in the correct manner because the house was outfitted with the necessary equipment. Elliot never really had a chance. As soon as he opened the boa's cage, the snake lunged at him, coiling around his body and neck in seconds. It then began tightening its grip. Even as Elliot contemplated his last moments on Earth, even as his life flashed before his eyes, his grandmother walked in. The scene being played out before her was horrific. There laid Elliot, collapsed in agony, his large boa constrictor wrapped around his neck. She screamed for help, but quickly regained her composure and dialed 911. When officers from the Upper McCungie Township Police Department got the distress call, they immediately rushed to the Sensman residence. A team arrived only to find Elliot now unconscious and showing heart attack symptoms. 
In their report, patrol officers wrote, he was unresponsive and lying on the floor of the home with the mid portion of a large snake wrapped around the male's neck. The officers were unsure what to do. The reptile looked more than 15 feet. Moreover, it was impossible to shoot the reptile in the head, which would risk injury to Elliot. Finally, they shot the snake several times in the lower body. It was enough to make the reptile loosen its grip, and that was enough to allow the officers to pull it off Elliot. Elliot was rushed to the Lehigh Valley Hospital, Cedar Crest, where doctors tried to save him. He spent four days in critical care, but did not respond to treatment. On July 24th, four days after the incident, Elliot died. His doctors attributed his death to severe anoxic brain injury due to asphyxiation by constriction. Elliot Sensman's death by his pet boa constrictor raised many questions. Investigations were carried out soon after, during which his mother explained how careful he had always been around snakes. My son was unique and kind and should still be with his family and friends, she said. The problem in the U.S. and many parts of the world is the pet trait. Snakes are often regarded as exotic pets. However, many people can't manage these reptiles once they grow larger. Boa constrictors and pythons especially end up being unwanted or abused. Elliot was always at hand to receive such snakes and help them recover or find a forever home. Explaining his rescue mission for snakes, Elliot's mother Heather said, too many people get these snakes and can't handle or take care of them. They shouldn't be bred to be kept as pets. A lot of times, the snakes were neglected or mistreated and needed medical care. He would provide all of that. He wanted them to be in a habitat as close to their natural environments as possible since they couldn't be put in the wild. In 2019, in Oxford, Indiana, there was a house that no one lived in on North Dan Patch Drive. But that's not to say that it was uninhabited. In fact, it had the most inhabitants in the entire block. It was home to 140 snakes. They were all different shapes, sizes, and species, and the majority of them were owned by Benton County Sheriff Don Munson. His enthusiasm for snakes had rubbed off on his daughter, and he agreed to take one of his snakes to her elementary school one day. The snake he chose to take was Simba, a beautiful reticulated python who was 13 feet or 4 meters long and weighed 45 pounds or 20 kilograms. The children were in awe of the large reptile and were eager to stroke its smooth, shiny skin. He was a hit with the school and the principal, and at the time, Don said he had 52 snakes in his garage. He was breeding them to sell. It wasn't long before their numbers grew. Don owned a house that was full of snakes, and he had purposefully kitted it out to hold his huge collection of reptiles. He lived in the house next door, which meant he was able to regularly check on them. He bred them for sale on the open market. But 20 of them weren't his. They belonged to another snake enthusiast. Her name was Laura Hurst. She was a 36-year-old mother of two. Laura grew up on the family's cattle farm. She loved the outdoors. She loved riding motorcycles, spending weekends on the river, and most of all, rescuing and rehabilitating snakes. It was a passion of hers, and being able to house her pet snakes at Don Munson's property was an ideal arrangement. She lived just 20 minutes away and checked on them twice a week. Laura's friends were aware of her love for snakes, and once she brought one into work, much to the delight of her colleagues. The snake's house was a single-story building, a dark blue painted bungalow with a garage on one end. Inside, there were hundreds of cages and tanks for the snakes. The conditions they were kept in were in accordance with the law, but Don had never registered his snake breeding business with local authorities, and this could have proved illegal. No signs were in place to warn visitors of the snakes within the premises, and so nobody knew what was in there except for Don's family and Laura. That was until disaster struck. On Wednesday, October 30th, 2019, Laura, who worked as a harness engineering build technician, drove towards North Dan Patch Drive in the evening. She pulled into the concrete driveway and opened the front door. 
She inspected the tanks and cages and fed her snakes. Then she took out one of Don's snakes. It was a reticulated python, eight feet or two and a half meters in length. Carefully, she lifted the reptile out of its tank. Its tongue flicked in and out of its closed mouth. Its body was cool to the touch. The skin was beautifully patterned and silky smooth. Laura sat down with it as it crawled over her legs, inspecting the room they were in, its slender yet muscular body pulling it along the floor. Reticulated pythons are native to South and Southeast Asia. They are popular within the pet industry as they are relatively easy to keep in captivity. They can grow up to 20 feet or 6 meters long and weigh up to 165 pounds or 75 kilograms. In the wild, they typically feed on mammals such as rodents, primates, pigs, and deer. They are not venomous. Instead, they kill their prey by constriction. They are ambush predators, lying in wait for an unsuspecting animal to come along. Then they use their super-fast reactions to strike, capturing the animal in its jaws before wrapping its body around it and squeezing it to death. In Indonesia, they are becoming a problem particularly for people living in rural communities. Due to the fragmentation of their habitats, largely from deforestation to make way for oil palm plantations, the reticulated pythons have to travel across farmland in search for food. Workers in the fields have been targeted recently, and their colleagues or families find them sometimes wrapped in the coils of the snakes, or sometimes, shockingly, inside the snake itself once it has swallowed them whole. But despite the dangers these animals pose to humans, snake lovers the world over still handle them and enjoy doing so. Laura picked the huge python up off the floor and put it back in its tank. It was heavy. She lifted it up onto her shoulders and began walking back towards the open tank. But as she did so, the snake tightened its grip around her neck. Laura pulled at it slightly to loosen it, but the more she pulled, the more the snake tightened. It was incredibly strong, and Laura tried to move her head out from underneath it, but there was no room. Within a split second, the snake had coiled so tightly around Laura's neck that she couldn't free herself. She felt the pressure in her face rise as it squeezed tighter and tighter, its muscles constricting. Laura tried to twist its head, but she couldn't reach it. She clawed at its skin as the blood supply to her head was cut off from the rest of her body. The snake barely moved, its unblinking eyes were fixed, its shiny skin pooled around Laura's neck. She began to struggle to breathe, her lips turned blue and her eyes bulged, and she knew she was in serious trouble. She couldn't scream, she couldn't reach her phone, things were happening too fast, and within minutes, she felt herself become dizzy from lack of oxygen and blood supply to the brain. She knew she was about to pass out. Seconds later, she fell to the floor. The snake continued to asphyxiate her, even though she now lay motionless and unresponsive on the ground. Don looked out of his window that evening and noticed Laura's car in the driveway. He knew she usually checked the snakes on a Wednesday evening, and so he decided to pop over and see how she was doing. He opened the front door and called out to her. There was no reply. He walked through the menagerie and passed the open tank. Then he stepped into the next room. There, lying on the floor, was Laura. And still wrapped around her neck was the eight-foot-long python. Don rushed to her side. The snake was wrapped loosely around Laura's neck, and so he pulled it off easily. He immediately called emergency services. When they arrived, they tried to revive Laura, but tragically, she was gone. Naturally, Don was in the firing line following Laura's death. What was he doing with so many snakes in his home? Did he have the necessary paperwork to legally house them all? It seems the licensing surrounding keeping reptiles in Indiana wasn't all that clear. The Indiana Department of Natural Resources doesn't regulate reticulated pythons because they are not a native species. They do, however, regulate venomous snakes and those that are considered endangered. But seeing as reticulated pythons are none of these, they do not require permits. Since 1978, there have been 18 known deaths by constricting snakes within the U.S. However, reptile enthusiasts claim that dogs do far more damage to people than snakes causing serious injuries or deaths each year. 
It's only because an attack like Laura's is incredibly rare that it makes the headlines. Following the aftermath, town council members were keen to impose a new law on snakes in the state. It would ensure that people were made aware of who kept snakes and where they were kept for safety reasons and in case of an emergency. But Don could have been in more trouble if he was breeding the snakes to sell and hadn't registered the property as a business. None of these outcomes would bring back Laura, and it is unlikely they would have prevented this from happening in the first place. People with a passion for certain potentially dangerous animals know the risks they take. And, like with so many things, nobody ever believes it will happen to them. Until it does. Dan Brandon was more than a snake enthusiast. He was a true herpetologist with an unbridled love for these fascinating creatures. Nestled in his Hampshire, England bedroom, he harbored not just a collection, but a genuine passion for his 10 snakes and 12 tarantulas. These animals weren't mere showpieces, they were his heart's delight. His fascination with reptiles took root at the tender age of 10, watching documentaries that held him spellbound. By 15, he welcomed his first snake into his life, and from there, his bedroom sanctuary evolved into a thriving menagerie. Despite the abundance of creatures, Dan cared for each one meticulously. Their tanks were state-of-the-art, and he fed them only the finest fare. Occasionally, he let them explore his bedroom, showcasing his expertise in herpetology. Among his beloved pets, Tiny held a special place in his heart. This 2.4-meter African rock python was a giant among snakes, capable of growing up to 4 meters or even more. Native to sub-Saharan Africa, these non-venomous behemoths typically feasted on everything from rodents and birds to monkeys, warthogs, antelopes, and yes, even crocodiles in the wild. To Dan, Tiny was like his baby, and he treated her that way. When he first got her, she could fit right in his hand. But as time passed, she grew and grew, and she eventually reached a whopping eight feet in length, all muscle. Pythons don't just constrict anything they see, it takes a lot of effort, and they typically do it when they're planning to have a meal. They're pretty smart, and they can sense when the animal's heart stops, and that's when they loosen their grip. As Tiny grew in both girth and length, Dan couldn't help but notice her increasing strength. He had to change the way he handled her. Gone were the days of casually draping her around his neck like he did with his other snakes. It was just too risky. Although Tiny wasn't the type to squeeze him out of aggression, she sometimes wrapped herself around him, seeking warmth and comfort. But Dan knew better than to let her do that. He realized that if she ever coiled around him too tightly, he'd have to start peeling her off, starting with her tail. The potential danger was just too great. Then came that fateful day on August 25, 2017. Dan had just returned home from work. He worked as a landscaper. His usual routine was to head straight upstairs to change before coming back down. But on this evening, everything changed. Shortly after he went upstairs, there was an ominous thud that echoed through the house. Strangely, there were no cries or shouts from Dan afterward, which raised alarm bells for his parents. His dad decided to investigate. The details of the incident remain somewhat unclear, but it appears that Dan was handling Tiny, as he normally did. He had draped her across his shoulders, and he lovingly stroked her silky smooth skin. Tiny, with her flickering tongue tasting the air, started to grip him a little tighter. Sensing potential danger, Dan began to gently pull her off. Then, for reasons unknown, Tiny suddenly coiled her muscular body around Dan. Eight feet of pure snake power pressed tightly against his body, crushing his blood vessels and restricting oxygen to his brain. In mere seconds, Dan began to feel faint, like he was about to pass out. And then it happened. The world plunged into darkness, and Dan slumped to the floor. Startled by the fall, Tiny quickly released her grip and slithered off. She found a corner of the room and curled up, leaving behind a scene of shock and terror. When Dan's dad cautiously pushed open the bedroom door and took in the alarming scene, his heart sank. There lay Dan, sprawled face down on the floor, and Tiny, his cherished python, was conspicuously absent from her tank. Panic seized him as he bellowed for Dan's mother to dial emergency services. 
She raced upstairs, joining the frantic effort to revive their son. But Dan remained unresponsive. Eight agonizing minutes later, paramedics arrived, their valiant efforts overshadowed by the grim reality. The 31-year-old Dan couldn't be saved. Meanwhile, Tiny had seemingly retreated to a corner of the room, her demeanor strangely tranquil. The events leading to Dan's tragic demise remained shrouded in mystery. The coroner's examination pointed to asphyxiation by the snake, but the hows and whys remained elusive. Oddly, there were no telltale marks around Dan's neck or chest. No bruises, no signs of trauma. However, snake expert and professor Scott Bobak brought a new perspective to the table. He challenged the conventional wisdom, asserting that constrictors like Tiny typically didn't dispatch their prey through asphyxiation. Rather, it was more often attributed to cardiac arrest. The eight-foot-long python, Bobak explained, could swiftly restrict blood flow to Dan's brain, plunging him into unconsciousness and triggering cardiac arrest due to lack of oxygen and blood flow to the heart. As the investigation deepened, another snake expert and veterinarian named John Cooper joined the fray. His focus, Tiny's recently shed skin. A careful examination revealed no signs of struggle from Dan, no telltale fingernail marks hinting at a desperate fight for his life. With a cautious hand, John moved to gently lift Tiny and return her to the confines of her tank. But Tiny, still as spirited as ever, struck out defensively. It begged the question, could this seemingly unassuming python be responsible for Dan's untimely demise? The coroner, however, was hesitant to pin the blame on Tiny's aggression. Dan bore no bite marks on his body, a conspicuous absence if the snake had indeed launched a predatory assault clamping her jaws onto him while constricting, which would typically leave a clear bite mark. The prevailing theory was that Tiny might have been displaying an eerie form of affection toward her owner. Yet reptiles aren't known to express affection as conventional pets do. Pythons, considered somewhat unpredictable, can develop bonds with their handlers, though distinct from the human dog or human cat connections. If not in a predatory mood, pythons might tighten their grip if they perceive a threat. A sudden movement by Dan, for instance, might have prompted Tiny's instinctual response, much like how they tighten their coils when a tree sways or a branch snaps in the wild, preventing a fall. Could it be that Tiny, if only momentarily, felt insecure and unwittingly hugged her beloved owner to the brink of death? There were faint signs of a rib fracture on one of Dan's ribs possibly from Tiny's coiling. Months later, Dan's parents, struggling to manage the ever-growing python, made a poignant choice. Unable to put Tiny down, despite her suspected involvement in their son's death, they decided to rehome her. Their choice led Tiny to the National Center for Reptile Welfare at Hadlow College in Tunbridge, Kent. In the end, the shadow of mystery still looms over the incident. And only Tiny knows the chilling secrets that unfolded that fateful evening in Dan's bedroom. Their day began with the innocent joy of visiting a farm and playing with animals. After their farm adventure, they returned to their friend's apartment, which was right above a reptile store called Reptile Ocean. The store was owned by Jean-Claude Savoie, and it was a place filled with fascinating reptiles and creatures that captured the boys' imagination. Jean-Claude Savoie was seen as someone who knew a lot about reptiles, and he seemed to take good care of them. Among the animals he had was a massive 13-foot African rock python, a snake that would become a part of a tragic story. This python had been found by the Canadian Wildlife Service years earlier, and they were trying to find it a new home. They initially wanted to send it to the Magnetic Hill Zoo in Moncton, but the zoo couldn't provide a suitable enclosure at the time. So Jean-Claude decided to take the snake in. Little did anyone know that this seemingly kind act would lead to a heartbreaking incident a decade later. Jean-Claude built a special glass tank for the python in his apartment high above the reptile store. It was a tall tank that reached from the floor to the ceiling where the snake could live. However, this decision would turn out to be a big mistake. You see, the province didn't allow people to keep pythons as pets, and Jean-Claude didn't have the right permits. This was his second critical error, and it would result in a terrible tragedy involving two innocent boys. 
On that fateful evening, after a day filled with play and laughter with Jean-Claude's son, Noah and Connor Barth settled down for a night's rest in the living room of the apartment. Their young friend, blissfully unaware of the impending danger, slept soundly in his own bedroom. Little did they know that a deadly menace was lurking nearby, ready to shatter their peaceful night. In a chilling twist of fate, the massive rock python managed to escape its enclosure. With silent determination, it navigated the inner structures of its glass prison, ultimately reaching the lid. In a heart-stopping moment, the lid gave way, granting the serpent its freedom. With its flickering tongue and piercing eyes, the snake slithered across the room, its senses finely tuned. It was drawn to a high vent on the wall, an enticing scent guiding its path. Unbeknownst to anyone, Jean-Claude had removed the vent's filter cap a few days earlier, a seemingly innocent act that would prove to be the third fatal error in this tragic sequence of events. The snake cautiously inserted its head through the exposed opening, curiosity piqued by unfamiliar scents. What followed was a slow, methodical progression as the serpent made its way through the ventilation system that ran above the room where the two brothers lay in peaceful slumber. Silently, it navigated the narrow pipes, its sinuous body adapting to the cramped confines. But this formidable snake, weighing a staggering 45 kilograms or 100 pounds, and measuring 4.3 meters, or 14 feet in length, posed a weight that the air ducts were never designed to support. Unbeknownst to the innocent brothers below, snugly nestled beside each other, the perilous countdown had begun. As the serpent hovered directly above the unsuspecting boys, the fragile ceiling panels in the ductwork finally gave way. The massive python plummeted downward, landing on top of the startled siblings with shocking force. Before they could fully comprehend the horrifying situation unfolding in the pitch-black room, the snake's powerful coils ensnared them, sealing their fate in an instant. The snake squeezed Connor and Noah really hard with its strong muscles. It bit them over and over, trying to control them. They screamed for help, but no one came. In just a few minutes, the snake's tight grip took their lives away. They couldn't breathe, and they started to fade and lose consciousness. Soon, they hung lifeless in the giant snake's hole. The next morning, when Jean-Claude checked on the boys, he knew something was very wrong. He rushed to where they lay. The ceiling had fallen on them, and they were pale. They had bite marks, bruises on their necks and chests, and blood oozing from their wounds. Panicked, Jean-Claude called their mom, who lived next door. Her partner rushed to help the boys, but it was too late. They called for help, but Jean-Claude was so scared that he had trouble explaining. When Jean-Claude opened the door to let the ambulance and police in, he was shaking and had blood on his hands. The snake was gone. The next day, the doctor said the snake had caused the brothers' deaths. Connor had many wounds, bruises, and bleeding in his neck muscles. Noah had bite marks all over his body. The doctor said they died because the snake squeezed their necks too hard. The snake was put to sleep, and a vet checked it. They found nothing strange about the snake, and it hadn't eaten for at least a day. But this raised a serious question. Was this a terrible accident, or something more sinister? People had different opinions. Jim Harrison, the director of the Kentucky Reptile Zoo, said it was possible for a big snake to constrict both boys at once. He thought maybe the snake was attracted by the smell of the farm animals the boys played with that day. However, snake experts didn't agree. They said pythons don't usually attack like that. Even if it fell on the boys, it wouldn't immediately attack, as Jean-Claude suggested. Killing both boys without anyone hearing or seeing anything was almost impossible. This made it very suspicious. There was no evidence that the python tried to eat the boys, so it didn't seem like a normal predatory attack. Maybe the snake felt threatened after falling from the ceiling but we'll never know for sure. When the police came to the apartment, Jean-Claude was outside, pacing back and forth. He had blood on his hands, but they couldn't tell if it was his or the boy's. If it was his, why was he bleeding? Did he try to fight the snake, or did he hurt himself on the ceiling, or was there something else going on? At first, they thought it was a terrible accident, 
But 18 months later, in February 2015, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police arrested Jean-Claude, charging him with criminal negligence. However, a jury trial in November 2016 found him not guilty. Regardless of the verdict, a mother and father lost their two beloved boys that night. No matter what happens in court, they can never bring them back. Heartbreaking photos shared by the boy's mother, Mandy Tresserton, showed how happy they were in every picture. One photo in particular shows them cleaning the python's enclosure, both soaked and smiling. The brothers loved visiting their neighbor's house, where they enjoyed being around the reptiles. In the end, the courts ruled that it was a terrible accident, and they hoped others would learn from it. But nothing can ever bring those two boys back, and their loved ones will carry that pain forever. Donnie Morrison was remembered by his classmates as a cheeky boy who was always the joker at school. Now at 68 years old, his former classmates could see that he hadn't changed a bit. A reunion had brought the men and women together 60 years later. They had lived a lifetime apart, but it also felt like just yesterday that some of them were sitting in the classrooms and walking the school grounds as they were now. Donnie was attending Kumala State School's 100th anniversary, along with hundreds of other people. He had fond memories of the place and was among many former pupils to attend the celebratory event. It took place on September 9, 2023. The school was situated 60 kilometers south of Mackay, on Queensland's north coast. It was surrounded by bush and cane farms in the rural and coastal town of Kumala. Donnie had never left the area. It was his hometown. He and his friend Lloyd Younger were socializing that evening when Lloyd suddenly felt something sharp on his ankle. He instinctively kicked his foot and looked down. There, attached to his leg, was a snake. But this wasn't just any snake. They believed that it was an eastern brown snake. Its body was shimmering, its glossy scales a beautiful brown-gray color. Each scale outlined perfectly in a dark brown line. They could see its round, jet-black eyes, its muscular body, as it gripped Lloyd's leg. Native to eastern and central Australia, as well as southern New Guinea, the snake is considered the second most venomous in the world after the inland Taipan. It's widespread throughout the dry areas of Australia, and despite popular misconceptions, it's common in urban areas as well as the rural bush. Locals know the damage they can cause. The eastern brown snake is responsible for the most snake bite fatalities in Australia. Donnie knew he had to act fast to save his friend. With little regard for his own safety, he leapt into action. Talking to his friend to keep him calm, he slowly bent down closer to the snake. Lloyd was starting to panic as he knew the dangers from the eastern brown snake, but having his friend there was reassuring. Carefully, Donnie brought his hands around the back of the snake. When they were hovering just inches from the coiled reptile, he made a grab for it. But in the dusky light of the evening, he misjudged the movement of the snake's head, and it spotted Donnie's hands coming for it. The snakes are lightning fast, striking at two meters per second. Although this was a relatively slow strike speed for a snake, it was quick enough to catch Donnie. In a split second, it released its grip on Lloyd and whipped around. It bit down on Donnie's arm, and he let out a cry. But with the other hand, he managed to seize the reptile. He held firmly onto its long body. He could feel the power of its muscles in his hand. He rushed over to the edge of the lawn, carrying the writhing, wriggling snake with him. He wanted to get it as far away from the guest as possible. He held it out at arm's length whilst it struck at him repeatedly. He managed to avoid the strikes each time as he arched his body away from the deadly blows, but then it caught him once more on the chest before Donnie flung it into the undergrowth, away from others at the party. He instinctively rubbed his chest where the snake had delivered its bite. He turned around to see the celebration still going on on the school field. He could hear the chatter of the crowd, he could see the familiar faces of his former classmates and he walked back over. But he began to feel faint. He staggered back to Lloyd and collapsed on the ground by his feet. Those who saw him drop to the floor rushed to his side. Donnie clutched his chest. He could feel the venom surging through his bloodstream, his heart pumping the toxic substance to every corner of his body. His head was pounding. Sweat dripped from his brow. While three milligrams of the eastern brown snake's venom are enough to kill a man, 
the population of snakes in Queensland are known to produce three times that amount when they strike their prey. Donnie was in serious trouble. Any venom for the eastern brown snake has been around since 1956 and is effective at treating the victim, but that requires them to get to a medical center before their body gives in. Donnie was struggling to breathe. His breath came in short, sharp bursts. His chest felt like it was being squeezed, like a huge weight was pushing down on him. His vision became blurry, and he succumbed to the bite. Those by his side immediately rolled him on his back and began performing CPR. It was an immensely stressful scene for those who witnessed it. Emergency services were called, and when paramedics arrived, they performed CPR on Donnie for 30 minutes. They tried to restart his heart using a defibrillator, but nothing worked. He was gone. While Donnie couldn't be saved, there was still hope for Lloyd. A helicopter was called in, and he was airlifted to McKay Base Hospital, around 60 kilometers north of the school. He arrived in time and was treated for the snake bite. He was released from the hospital the following day. The celebratory event had come crashing to a devastating end. It was shut down and everyone dispersed, feeling a sense of shock and loss. What was supposed to be an enjoyable evening, months in the making, had turned into a tragedy as Kumala lost one of its own. As word spread of Donnie's accident and untimely death, it made news headlines. It seemed he was yet another Australian who had fallen victim to the Eastern Brown Snake. He had become a statistic, adding to the one or two deaths caused by that species of snake every year in Australia. But there was more to it than that. Although there were visible bites from the snake on his arm and his chest, the coroner recorded no venom found in his body. He had been bitten, there was no doubt about that, but eastern brown snakes are reported as delivering dry bites 80% of the time. This is where the snake bites the victim, but does not inject venom. In some snakes, this can be due to a failure on the snake's part from it feeling unwell, having damaged or empty venom glands, or misjudging the distance to the prey and missing altogether. But when a dry bite is delivered on purpose, as is often the case with eastern brown snakes, they do so as a warning. When they bite defensively, there is no need to inject venom. The strike alone can repel the threat. It seems that not only Donnie received a dry bite, but so did Lloyd. The snake was sending them a warning. Lloyd may have inadvertently stumbled or stepped on the snake. It was hidden in the grass in the fading light of the evening. Instinctively and defensively, it lashed out, striking Lloyd's ankle and lashing on with its body. It wasn't trying to capture any prey, and it wasn't acting aggressively, so there was no need for the use of venom. So what happened to Donnie if the snake didn't inject its venom into him? A full report on his death has not yet been released, but it's believed that he suffered a cardiac arrest due to some unknown underlying health condition. His heart attack may have been triggered by the fear he felt while dealing with one of the most venomous snakes in the world, but it was not as a direct result of the venom itself. Following Donnie's death, his family made a heartfelt statement thanking those who rushed to his aid. They offered support to those who tried to revive him and to those who witnessed the traumatic event. They said that Donnie had been a popular member of the Kumala community and would be missed by many people. When you kiss your children goodbye as they leave for school each morning, you don't for one minute expect it to be the last time. But that is exactly what happened to 17-year-old Melody Chipatura's parents in Zimbabwe on January 12, 2023. Melody was a Form 6 pupil at Rushinga High School in Mashonalan. Situated in northern Zimbabwe, the region largely consists of rolling hills, river valleys, and is bordered by the Zambezi River. She was a dedicated individual who took her education seriously. Whenever there were events at the school, she would help out with the cooking and catering. She was expected to do very well in her advanced level exams, but that Thursday afternoon in January was to be her last. Not long back from the festivities of the holiday season, the students were getting back into the swing of things as the school day wore on. As was usual on Thursday afternoon, Melody and her classmates were outside playing sports. Their shouts and laughter traveled across the school playing fields. But something was drawn to the school grounds that afternoon. 
perhaps vibrations through the ground of children playing, perhaps a particular smell promising prey nearby. It was a silent killer, one of the most feared snakes in Africa, the black mamba. So called for the black inside of its mouth, these snakes contain enough venom to kill six fully grown men with a single bite. They can grow up to nine feet long. Although they are shy of humans and try to avoid conflict, they are also known to be naturally aggressive snakes, unafraid of striking if something or someone comes too close. They seem to have no fear. And although there is an anti-venom available, it is a race against time to receive treatment as some people are dead within 45 minutes of a black mamba bite and all within 16 hours if left untreated. A black mamba hatches from its egg with around two to three drops of venom in each of its fangs. As an adult, that increases to as much as 12 to 20 drops. However, just two drops of venom is enough to kill a human. But the school wasn't in typical black mamba habitat. They prefer long grass or sugarcane fields where they can hunt for small rodents and birds in the undergrowth. The school's grass was cut short. There was no overgrown brush near the school. Even so, a deadly black mamba made its way onto the school field. The loud shouting and noise coming from the sports ground must have frightened the snake inside. Silently, it slid up the concrete steps and in through the school doors. The school was quiet and calm. The snake worked its way down the corridors and into an empty classroom. The people of Zimbabwe are no strangers to the dangers of black mambas. Only five months before, three members of the same family were struck down by a black mamba in a mountainous region of the country. None of them survived. In Africa, most deaths caused by snake bites are attributed to the Cape Cobra and the black mamba. Most of the time, the bites occur in the rural regions where healthcare is limited and transport can be slow. Anti-venom is essential to treat the victim and is the difference between life and death. It was nearing the end of the day. Melody and the other students had finished their sports and made their way inside to their classrooms to be dismissed for the day. It was just before 4 p.m., just before home time, when Melody would walk back to her house and greet her parents like she did every day. But today was not like any other day. She didn't notice a dark gray reptile on the floor near her chair. It was lying still until its head began to rise up from the rest of its body. It could see the students piling into the classroom and its instincts began to kick in. Its defensive and aggressive killer instincts. Melody dutifully sat down, waiting for the teacher to come in and dismiss the class. As she sat down, she felt a sharp, needle-like pain on her thigh. She looked down, and to her horror, she stared right into the face of a black mamba, its black eyes looking up at her as its head was raised two feet off the floor. Its mouth was agape, showing its deathly black mouth. Its tongue flicked in and out, and it hissed menacingly. Melody screamed, crying out that she had been bitten by a snake. Her fellow pupils turned to see the black mamba raised to strike again. They leapt out of the windows, screaming as they did so. Staff rushed to the scene and inspected Melody. Within five minutes, Melody was already on the way to Rashinga Medical Clinic. The snake was definitely a black mamba. Nobody could mistake it for anything else. Everyone knew it, and everyone knew that time was of the essence. If Melody had any chance of survival, she needed anti-venom right away. The venom was now coursing through her body, working its way to the central nervous system. Her thundering heart, pounding in her chest from the panic and fear that gripped her, only accelerated the toxicity of the venom. There was nothing anybody could do to slow down the diffusion of the toxin. At first, Melody felt a tingling sensation in her thigh, where the snake had bitten her. It spread throughout her leg and into her other limbs. Very quickly, her breathing became labored, and her body began shutting down. The black mamba's venom works by affecting the transmission across the motor end plate of nerves. This stops messages from crossing from the nerves to the muscles, essentially causing paralysis. This means the muscles involved in breathing and in keeping the heart beating cease to function, and the victim dies from cardiac and or respiratory failure. Cardiac and respiratory support can be applied to keep the victim alive while the muscles are otherwise paralyzed. Antivenom is administered intravenously, as uptake from a muscular injection is considered too slow. 
Melody's parents were called while she was en route to the medical clinic. She was rushed through the doors and her parents arrived just 20 minutes after Melody had been bitten. They brought with them an herbal healer, someone they hoped could save their daughter's life. But herbs weren't going to fight off the toxicity of black mamba venom, one of the most potent toxins known to man. The local Chimhanda hospital was also called by the school and the doctors told them to bring her there straight away, along with the snake if it had been killed successfully. Positive identification was paramount to administer the correct antidote, but Melody didn't have a chance at receiving any antivenom. She never made it to the hospital, and she died just 30 minutes after being struck in her classroom. It is still unclear exactly what the snake was doing in the school building as the grounds were so far away from its typical habitat. There was a report that a villager had earlier spotted the snake in the local community and had attacked it. The snake then slithered off and found refuge in the relatively quiet school classroom. It was a very hot day, too, with some suggesting that the snake was seeking the coolness of the building as it sheltered from the heat outdoors. Everyone was in shock for somebody who was so active and alert just minutes before, who was now lying deceased, was a terrible tragedy. Melody's father, Joseph Chipatura, who serves as a ZANU PF counselor in Rushinga, said that she had high aspirations and hoped to be a psychologist one day, but it was not to be. The long holiday weekend in May was something Oliver Baker and his family were looking forward to. It was a chance to relax at their holiday home at Alabama's Lewis Smith Lake. They had also recently bought a puppy who joined them on their trip. Oliver worked in water quality control for the city of Northport in Alabama. He had grown up in the Birmingham area and remained relatively local ever since. At 52 years old, he was much loved by all who knew him. He always went out of his way to make people feel welcome or to help somebody in need. He was a role model for his two young sons. While the family was inside their Smith Lake house in Walker County, Oliver opened the back door and stepped outside onto the stone patio. Their holiday home looked out over Smith Lake, which is a reservoir and the largest lake in Alabama. It's also considered one of the cleanest lakes with a rich diversity of wildlife. Deer, fox, raccoons, groundhogs, and chipmunks all frequent the surrounding woodland, and so do copperhead snakes. The copperhead is common and widespread across eastern North America. It's a species of pit viper, a venomous snake that possesses a pit organ, which allows the snakes to see in infrared. They can detect their prey in even the darkest of places. The heat radiated from the animal's body is a dead giveaway. Nothing they can do will stop the copperhead from sensing their whereabouts and homing in on their prey. Despite their venom and their infrared detecting abilities, copperheads are rarely dangerous to humans. The bites can be painful, but the venom is the least potent of all pit vipers, with a lethal dose being around 100 milligrams. It usually causes swelling at the site and intense throbbing and nausea, but is rarely fatal unless the person suffers an allergic reaction. They can control the amount of venom they inject at the time of a strike. Sometimes they don't inject any venom at all, known as a dry bite. These bites, as well as low-dose bites, serve as a warning to potential threats. Oliver had decided to take their Labrador puppy for a walk on that Friday. The countryside surrounding their home was a perfect place to enjoy the fresh air and scenery. They had walked around the lakeside multiple times before, looking out over the water and seeing the many different bird species that frequented the lake. But as he stepped outside the back door, he failed to notice something coiled up on the patio. It was a copperhead, camouflaged against the stone. Oliver looked out over the lake, not watching where he was putting his feet. The puppy trotted over the patio and down toward the water. As Oliver followed the puppy, he suddenly felt something sharp strike him. He immediately jumped and looked down by his feet. He was shocked to see a copperhead lying on the hard stone patio. It had been soaking up the heat from the stone, keeping its body warm, keeping its body active. It had been drawn to the sunny patch from the surrounding woodland. The pain from the strike immediately began searing around the bite site. Oliver quickly rushed indoors and called out to his family. 
he instantly felt an intense burning sensation and an incredible throbbing that radiated throughout his body. The pain was indescribable. The Copperhead had injected venom into his flesh, and it was now surging through his body, working its way through his blood vessels to all his major organs and muscles. Every fiber in his body ached. He knew he needed help right away. Oliver's family came rushing to his aid. He told them that he had been bitten by a Copperhead snake. He had identified it correctly, and one of his sons ran outside to the patio. There, still coiled up in the corner, was the coppery brown snake. It eyed Oliver's son, its head raised off its coils as its forked tongue flicked in and out of its mouth, smelling the air, sensing for danger. His son ran back inside and back to his father's side. Within a couple of minutes, Oliver was clutching his chest and having difficulty breathing. This was not a normal reaction. He was having a very severe reaction to the snake bite. His wife called the emergency services, and then Oliver collapsed on the floor of their home. He stopped breathing. Immediately, the family began CPR on him. Most people who are bitten by copperheads live to tell the tale. They aren't typically aggressive snakes and only strike people when they feel threatened and defensive. If somebody steps on or near them, then they are most likely to strike. Although nobody knows for sure, this is what likely happened to Oliver. Their bites are notoriously painful, and sometimes people can lose a finger or toe if that's where the snake has bitten them. If there are concerning symptoms, then it's always advised to seek medical attention. Anti-venom can be very costly in the U.S. if the victim doesn't have medical insurance. Incredibly, a single vial can cost upwards of $11,000, with a typical patient initially requiring between four and six vials. But around 50% of copperhead bites are dry or inject minimal venom, not requiring any medical treatment. But Oliver hadn't received a dry bite and there wasn't any anti-venom on hand. It had been less than a few minutes since the bite and Oliver had lost consciousness. He lay unresponsive on the floor while his family continued to breathe for him. Finally, the paramedics showed up and his two young sons and wife watched on helplessly as he was driven away in an ambulance. He was rushed to a local school playing field where they waited for a helicopter to arrive. But Oliver wasn't considered stable enough to fly by chopper to University of Alabama at Birmingham Hospital. Instead, the ambulance drove him to a Jasper hospital where they fought to stabilize him. Finally, the decision was made to airlift him to Huntsville because there weren't any available beds at the hospital. He remained in critical condition over the weekend. It was touch and go whether he would make it. His family just had to hope and pray that he would pull through. But his organs began shutting down, and despite doctors' best efforts, he began losing the fight. In a tragic turn of events, he died in Huntsville Hospital three days later on Memorial Day. He never regained consciousness after the snake bite. Oliver's death was a huge shock for the family. What had begun as an enjoyable trip for the holiday weekend had ended in tragedy. Oliver had otherwise been fit and well, and copperhead bites aren't usually considered fatal. Tragically, Oliver had suffered an extreme allergic reaction to the snake venom. He had succumbed to the bite within minutes, his body shutting down after experiencing anaphylactic shock. Between 7 and 8,000 people are bitten by snakes every year in the United States. Most of those are survivable, with just five people dying from them. Although the copperhead is the snake that tends to bite the most people, around 95% of the snake bite fatalities in the U.S. are caused by rattlesnakes. The city of Freer in Texas is famous for one thing, the annual Freer Rattlesnake Roundup. This event promises a weekend of snake competitions, handling displays, barbecue cook-offs, parades, and car shows. It draws in thousands of visitors every year, most of them excited to see the snake handlers work their magic with some of the most venomous snakes in the world. The Roundup is one of many that take place across the Midwest and Southern United States. More than 100,000 snakes have been known to have been caught from the wild each year during a single Roundup. It's a tradition that began in the middle of the 20th century, and while the snakes used to be killed for their skins, 
or sold to handlers and collectors, now many of them are returned to the wild after the event. As experts show off the size of their rattlesnakes and educate the audience about their characteristics, they often tell the audience, don't try this at home, leave it up to the experts. But sometimes the experts do get it wrong. On April 30th, 2022, 60-year-old Eugene DeLeon Sr. was performing at the Roundup. He was considered one of the most experienced snake handlers at the show, having tamed and handled snakes for more than 20 years. But despite his expertise and vast knowledge of the rattlesnakes, something was about to go horribly wrong. And tragically, the Roundup of 2022 would be Eugene's last. Eugene had lived his whole life in Freer. In his professional career, he was an oil field worker for Straight Line Construction, High Tide Oil Field Services, and XTX LLC. Now in his 60s, Eugene worked as a custodian at Freer High School and was also a member of the Freer Volunteer Fire Department, giving back to the community through volunteering his time to help save lives. But his true passion was handling rattlesnakes, and he was well known in the local area for it. With Texas home to nine different species of rattlesnake, Eugene's phone was always ringing from worried residents who had found a rattlesnake on their property. He would willingly arrive at their home and expertly capture the snake and relocate it. That was what he was known for. As the town of Freer swelled that April weekend with the influx of visitors to the annual show, Eugene readied himself for his performance. He was a firm favorite with the regulars and a crowd gathered around as he began to describe the rattlesnakes in his care. He held them firmly in his grasp, showing off their long bodies and their long fangs, some of them measuring more than an inch long. Education was part of Eugene's repertoire. It was important for people to understand the snakes and the dangers they posed, but also to treat them with the respect they deserve. But on that fateful day, Eugene miscalculated something. He had performed the same routine for years, but this time something went horribly wrong. Maybe it was lapse in judgment, maybe something spooked the snake or distracted Eugene. Whatever it was, Eugene wasn't expecting it. As he held the rattlesnake out in front of him, wowing the audience with his dance-like moves around the reptile, the snake suddenly wheeled around and struck him on the shoulder. It was a western diamondback rattlesnake. They are responsible for the majority of fatal snake bites in Mexico and the greatest number of snake bites in the whole of the United States. Rattlesnakes can strike at speeds of almost 3 meters per second, or 6.5 miles per hour. This doesn't sound that quick, but they can strike up to a third of their body length, which makes them difficult to get out of the way from when in close proximity. There was no time for Eugene to react. He'd allowed too much of the snake to dangle free from his hands and it had used its exceptionally muscular body to launch itself at its handler. Narrowly avoiding Eugene's face and neck, the snake sunk its fangs into the flesh on his shoulder instead. Eugene instantly put the snake back in its box and clutched his shoulder. Although the potency of the Western Diamondback rattlesnake's venom is lower than other species, it delivers a much higher dose than others owing to its large venom glands. This makes it exceptionally dangerous, and although the majority of people recover if they receive immediate medical assistance, the young, old, and those in poor health are most likely to succumb to the snake's toxicity. Paramedics that were already at the venue were alerted to the accident and rushed to the stage. Realizing the severity of the attack, a helicopter was flown in, and Eugene was airlifted to Corpus Christi Hospital, 80 miles away. It was 1 p.m., and doctors knew it was a race against time to save Eugene's life. When a rattlesnake bites, the venom is injected into the bloodstream, causing fatal damage if left untreated. Depending on the species, the venom can contain between 5 and 15 different substances, including enzymes, proteins, and polypeptides that make it a toxic mixture adapted for rapidly subduing its prey. Not only does the venom disable the victim, but some of its components begin to break down tissues which aid in digesting the animal once it has died. Eugene would have felt an intense pain at the bite site. His shoulder would have become swollen as the venom began breaking down muscle tissue and working its way through the body. The hemotoxic components disrupted the blood clotting abilities of Eugene's circulatory system. As blood cells started to be destroyed by the venom, 
the body's ability to clot and prevent massive internal bleeding was severely hampered. Victims need to resist the urge to tourniquet the area as this intensifies the toxicity of the venom at the bite site, causing permanent damage to the tissues. Sucking out the venom is also strongly advised against, as ingesting it can lead to other major problems. Instead, remaining calm and avoiding movement is the best way to slow the attack on the internal tissues before medical assistance can be sought. A numbness came over Eugene's face, his arms tingled and sweat dripped from his brow. He knew exactly what was happening to him. He was knowledgeable about the lethal capabilities of rattlesnake venom, and he had educated hundreds of people about it over the years. Although he could feel the venom taking hold, he forced himself to remain calm. It was the only thing he could do, trying to prevent the venom from coursing through his veins and spreading to every cell in his body. Paralysis began setting in as Eugene's helicopter arrived at the hospital. An overwhelming feeling of nausea came over him as he was wheeled into the emergency department. An IV line was set up immediately and much needed antivenom was pumped into his blood vessels. But the damage from the bite had been excessive. Eugene's blood pressure was dangerously low. His vital organs had taken a hit and were seriously damaged from the venom. The heart had been damaged and the next day or two would be crucial. But it didn't look like Eugene would make it into the next day. For the next eight hours, he and the doctors surrounding him battled courageously to stay alive. But his heart finally gave out at 9 p.m. that evening. Eugene was pronounced dead at the hospital. His sister, Monica Demas, paid tribute to Eugene, saying that her brother has gained his wings today, doing what he loved doing. He had a passion for snake handling at the Rattlesnake Roundup in Freer. A celebration of Eugene's life took place at St. Francis de Paula Catholic Church in July. Many came to pay their respects to the larger-than-life character. One thing he loved more than his beloved rattlesnakes was spending time with his family. Sadly, he left behind his mother, son, two daughters, and grandchildren. While most religious people attend church to pray, sing, and be thankful for all that is good in the world, other services offer something different, snakes. And it's not as uncommon as you might think. At 42 years old, Pastor Jamie Coots had two passions in life. One was to preach the good word of the Bible, and the other was handling snakes. While most of his services involved singing, preaching, testifying, and praying, occasionally he combined his two passions and brought us pet snakes into the church. Snake handling of this kind is considered a misdemeanor offense by law, but it's rarely enforced out of respect for religious freedoms. But handling deadly snakes and assuming that through preaching about the Lord will afford you immunity is a dangerous thing to believe in. Jamie's religious beliefs were so strong that he truly believed that the Lord would protect him against all harm. And for 22 years, he seemed to be right it seemed that the Lord was shining down on him. Although he was a third-generation snake handler and grew up around the animals, luck, or perhaps his faith, was about to run out. He had been bitten nine times by rattlesnakes and had rejected medical intervention each and every time. The power of the Lord would protect him, and that is all that he needed. While some prayed for his speedy recovery, Jamie's positive mental attitude and strong faith pulled him through each time. But those bites he had sustained weren't without their problems. One bite in 1993 nearly killed him, and he lost part of his finger to another bite in 1998. But at least he survived them, for now. Preaching using serpents is a unique and mysterious Christian sect. Some words from the Bible referring to immunity from snakes have been taken literally. During the services, Christians who feel empowered by God place their hands into boxes and stroke or pick up venomous snakes, believing that they will not be harmed. The pastors don't worship the snakes. Instead, they use them to convince non-Christians that God protects them from harm. There are about 125 snake handling churches across the United States, and the species used range from rattlesnakes, cottonmouths, and copperheads. The majority of these churches are situated in the Appalachia region of the eastern states. On Saturday, February 15, 2014, Jamie was preaching in the full gospel tabernacle in Jesus' name in Kentucky. 
It was a church that was founded by his grandfather in 1978. Prior to his life in the church, Jamie primarily worked as a truck driver for a mine. His fascination with snakes started at a young age, but it wasn't until he was 23 that he was considered a snake handler. When he became a pastor, he began touring the different churches, taking with him his beloved snakes. At his own church, he increased the number of snakes he used in the services, and he also increased the proportion of those with lethal potential. He was dicing with death. His practices were well known, as he had been featured in a National Geographic documentary called Snake Salvation, which focused on the unusual way of teaching the Bible. This only added to interest in his form of preaching, and people traveled from far and wide to witness his services. But his practices had had severe consequences before. Back in 1995, one member of the congregation, a 28-year-old woman, stepped forward to handle one of the rattlesnakes. She truly believed that she would be protected from the reptile's venom by God. As she reached out to handle the snake, it recoiled momentarily before striking her. It sank its fangs into her arm, and she cried out in alarm. Even with the searing pain growing more intense, the woman still believed that she would make it. She did not fear death. Instead, she knew that God was with her, and she was carried back to Jamie's house, where she lay on his couch as the venom took hold. Other members of the congregation joined her, standing around her praying as she lay there growing weaker and weaker. Hours later, she died. Despite tragedies like this, Jamie continued to use the practice of snake handling in his churches. He seemed to be above the law. Regardless of the fact that it was his snake that killed the woman, or that he had preached that it was safe to handle the snakes for those who truly embrace God, Jamie was never held accountable. He was initially charged in connection with the death, but the judge decided not to pursue it. Years after that tragic incident, Jamie was arrested in 2008. He was accused of illegally trafficking snakes. His obsession with the reptiles was not only getting others into trouble, but now he was picked up by officers for disobeying the law. Later, Jamie acquired the permits he needed to transport snakes across the states. Now, as he conducted his service in February 2014, he held up three different rattlesnakes. He loved the way they moved and their beautiful coloration and skin patterns. As he held his favorite snake in his hands, the congregation enthralled by the spectacle, danger was just moments away. He loved the feeling of handling the dangerous snakes. He knew that a single bite could kill him and yet he never felt afraid. It was the power of his faith and his belief that everything would be all right that kept his fear at bay. But perhaps he was blinded by his faith. Perhaps it was foolhardy to invite members of the congregation to risk their lives to prove that God was protecting them. As he held his favorite snake out in front of him, it suddenly wheeled around and bit Jamie on his right hand. He instinctively withdrew his hand about 25% of rattlesnake bites are dry bites, meaning that no venom is injected when the animal bites you. Maybe the previous nine bites Jamie had received were dry, and that's how he survived. As a small amount of blood trickled down the back of his hand, it was clear that the snake had pierced his skin and likely injected venom. But Jamie remained calm in front of his audience. He retreated to his home, believing that, like the previous times, he would be spared by the good Lord. But the venom was coursing through his body, eating away at his tissues and cells. Blood began leaking from his vessels. The clotting mechanism was impaired. Just like a cat, it appeared that Jamie only had nine lives. He had boasted about surviving the previous bites, but it seemed that on this tenth occasion, his body couldn't handle it. Jamie felt lightheaded and dizzy as he lay down on his sofa, trying to remain calm. The toxic mixture of proteins and enzymes inside the venom acted to subdue the victim. Some began digesting his internal organs. Others began affecting the beating of his heart. He was moments away from death. Emergency services had been alerted by a member of the congregation, but when they arrived at Jamie's property, the family refused to let them treat him. Even as Jamie lost consciousness, they still believed that he would come back to them. The anti-venom was tantalizingly close. Just a single shot or an IV drip, and he may have made it, but it wasn't to be. Just two hours after receiving the toxic bite, Jamie took 
his last breath. His family watched on as the man they loved, respected, and looked up to passed away right before their eyes. Now, Jamie's son, Cody Coots, has taken over being pastor at the Full Gospel Tabernacle in Jesus' name. And just like his father, he too is preaching alongside the handling of venomous serpents. Will history repeat itself? At the age of 23, Cody Coots had a big responsibility. His father had just died of a venomous snake bite while preaching in his church, and Cody had big shoes to fill. He took on the role as pastor of the same church, Full Gospel Tabernacle in Jesus' Name Church in Middlesboro, Kentucky. He was the fourth generation in his family to take up the practice of wielding venomous snakes during sermons, with the belief that God will protect them from harm. It's a growing practice throughout the states and began more than a hundred years ago, but it can be a deadly game. Pastors take the word from the Bible literally, following the preaching set out in Mark chapter 16, verse 18. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. Typically, the services are filled with blessings, prayers, and laying hands on the sick. Those inside the building believe in miracles and in the power of God. They truly believe that a higher power will protect them from harm. But many have lost their lives this way. Cody was there when his father, the previous pastor of the same church, was bitten by his favorite timber rattlesnake. He watched as his father refused medical treatment, instead believing that Almighty God would judge whether he lived or died. And seven minutes later, the decision was made, and Cody's father, Pastor Jamie Coots, collapsed and died from the venomous snake bite. Now, in August 2018, Cody was preaching in the same manner. His devoted congregation, consisting of around 14 individuals who hung on his every word, were enthralled by the young man. He was shouting down the microphone, holding a large rattlesnake up in the air above his head. He was building the tension in the room. Everyone felt the power he was bringing into the building. Members of the congregation watched and prayed, all believing in the protection God gave them. But in less than a split second, as Cody raised the snake up near his head, the snake struck out at him and bit him on the ear. He had been careless and foolish, bringing the snake within striking distance of his face, waving it around without a care in the world. But now that it had struck him, Cody hesitated slightly. The memory of his father being bitten four years earlier and collapsing in front of him raced through his mind, but his father had never once dropped a snake. He had been bitten nine times before, none of them needing medical attention. He had bounced back until that fatal bite in 2014, and even then, he calmly placed the snake back in its box. Cody decided he should do the same. He was well aware that this could be it for him, but he was so fired up from the service he was conducting that he pushed on. He shouted down the mic that he would be protected by God. I'm not worried, he shouted to his congregation. God is a healer. Meanwhile, he continued swinging the snake around with no regard for the animal whatsoever. There was little wonder why the snake lashed out. The vibrations from the loud microphone would have been incredibly distressing for the reptile, and being hurled through the air and down by Cody's side would have been terrifying. But in these situations, the snake had no choice but to strike. It was its instinct to strike when it felt like it was in danger. As blood poured from the bite wound, spraying and spattering all over Cody's blue shirt, he put the snake away. The venom was now coursing through his bloodstream. It was now acting on his nervous system, and his body was beginning to shut down. Any medically trained professional would have known that he needed immediate medical assistance. But Cody was defiant. All he needed was God. The searing pain in his ear was now throbbing all the way down his neck. His head felt heavy, and he began to retch in front of his audience. The poison that he believed he was immune from was taking hold. He tried to remain calm, but even with the power of God bearing down on him, he was beginning to struggle. The venom was slowly numbing his body, targeting the essential organs, and threatening to stop his heart and his lungs. He stumbled forward, and Big Cody, a man in the congregation, held him up. Pastor Cody told his congregation to take him to the top of the mountain where God would decide whether he lived or died. 
it was in God's hands now. But Big Cody had enough sense to know that the pastor had a better chance in the hospital with medical treatment than on top of a mountain. He rushed him outside and bundled him into his car. They then raced to the nearest hospital. Cody's initial refusal for medical care had delayed urgently needed treatment. It was now a race against time to get him the anti-venom he needed to stay alive. Cody's wife believed that something like this would someday happen to Cody. She knew how devastated the family had been when Jamie had passed away, and now it looked like Cody was following in his father's footsteps. She wasn't particularly religious herself, but she knew how important the church was for Cody. It had been in his family for generations. It was his duty to serve the people of Kentucky, and she wasn't going to stand in the way of that, even if it meant losing him prematurely. When Big Cody and the pastor arrived at the hospital, he was rushed to the emergency room where doctors fought to save his life. He was in a bad way, and nobody knew if he was going to make it. Those in his congregation prayed for him, and those in the emergency room tended to his wounds and pumped him full of the medication to counteract the deadly effects of the venom. Luckily, Cody pulled through. The whole dramatic sermon was caught on camera by a camera crew who was filming his way of preaching for a TV show. It demonstrates the dangers of performing stunts like that, all with the belief that God will save you if you're struck by a serpent. But more and more are succumbing to snake bites during sermons. Sometimes it's members of the congregation who step forward and touch the snake without fear, and other times it's the pastors themselves. Cody's father was just 42 when he succumbed to the rattlesnake bite in 2014. He had also witnessed a lady from his congregation drop dead from one of his snake's bites in 1995. A 60-year-old member of the congregation from a Pentecostal church in Jensen, Kentucky, named David Brock, died in 2015. A 44-year-old pastor named Mac Randall Wolford also died during a service in West Virginia in 2012. Even as the death toll mounted up from this unique way of preaching the Bible, people still attended the services. Today, they are very popular in eastern states and can last anywhere from 90 minutes to 5 hours, depending on the intensity of the occasion. Cody lived to preach another day, but he has since said that he needs to reevaluate his life. As a growing number of pastors are taking up the daring practice of snake handling during sermons, some are turning to the medical profession. Although they preach that God will protect them if poisoned, they know all too well that even the most religious men can fall victim to a toxic snake bite. There is nothing in the Bible that states a person cannot seek help for such an injury. Rejecting medical intervention in the event of a venomous snake bite is now considered old school by some. But there are a few pastors of the older generation that still hold on to the belief that God will heal them, and when they are bitten and do manage to survive, this only reinforces their belief. 